from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. My message is going to be brief and my text is going to be Luke, the 23rd chapter, beginning at verse 42. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The greatest and most historical event of all of history was when Jesus Christ died on that cross. And when Christ died on the cross, the lightning flashed. The thunder roared, the darkness came as the nails had gone into the hands of Christ and a spear had gone into his side and the nails through his feet and Jesus was hanging between heaven and earth, suffering for us. The soldiers had taken him out of his prison and they'd put a crimson robe on him. They'd beaten him two or three times and then they took two or three murderers with him two of them in particular who were going to be crucified with him. And then they took him across Jerusalem and they made each one of them bear a placard or at least a herald went before them to bear a placard telling of their crimes. And then Jesus stumbled and fell. He was weak from the loss of blood and they compelled an African to help him carry his cross and as long as the history of man shall go we will always remember that it was an African that helped Jesus bear his cross there are people today that say that Christianity is the white man's religion don't you believe it for all of those who believe in Jesus Christ he belongs to all people he came from that part of the world that touches Asia, Africa, and Europe. He belongs as much to the African as he does to the European, and as much to the European as he does to the Asian. Jesus Christ belongs to all people, but an African helped him carry his cross. And then when they got to Golgotha, these soldiers went about their work, nailing the nails in. These two murderers and thieves that were being crucified with Jesus were yelling, screaming, crying. But Jesus never uttered a word. And they took some medicated wine that acted as a sedative and gave it to the two thieves and they took it and they offered it to Jesus and he refused it because he wanted to drink the very bitter dregs of death in our place for us. He wanted to suffer all of death, showing that God loved the world and God was willing to forgive the sins of the world because of what Christ was doing on that cross. The people that were watching were laughing and sneering. They said, he saved others. Why can't he save himself? Come on, you worked great miracles. Why don't you work one more? You raised Lazarus from the dead. You raised a widow's son from the dead. Why can't you save yourself? Those blind people did not realize that God had foreordained and predetermined that Jesus Christ was to die the death of the cross and it was only through that death that the world could find forgiveness and salvation. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The Apostle Paul was an intellectual, one of the most brilliant men that ever lived. And Paul went to Corinth, pagan, intellectual, immoral Corinth, the university center of the ancient world, and Paul said, I'm determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why did Paul say that? He said that because God has locked up in the cross the secret of the universe. 
The only way that earth can ever find reconciliation with heaven is by way of the cross. The only way that you can ever get to heaven is by way of the cross. And if Jesus Christ had not gone to the cross, you could have never had sin forgiven. You could have never gone to heaven. And the problems of earth would have never had a solution. Only by the way of the cross can we find our way back to God. And that's why it was important that Jesus stay on the cross. Because you see, man is in rebellion against God. Adam and Eve rebelled in the Garden of Eden. And every man since Adam and Eve has broken God's law and sinned against God. And as a result of that, God and man are separated. And man's only way back to God is through Jesus Christ. Man had broken the law. Man deserved death. He deserved judgment. He deserved hell. But God said, wait a minute. I'll give my son. I'll let him die. I'll let him take the judgment and the hell for you. And if you will put your trust and your faith in my son, I will forgive your sin. I will change your life. I will give you an inner peace and joy and satisfaction that you would never find in any other way. So Jesus was dying on that cross for your sin and your sin. Some people say, why don't you try to make your gospel relevant? The most relevant message in the world tonight is the fact that Christ died for you. He died in your place. He shed his blood for you. And without that experience, no one can get to heaven. Yes, Jesus Christ died, and the people laughed and sneered. And two people that sneered and laughed the most were these two thieves and murderers that were dying with him. They were both mocking him, but one of them became strangely silent. And finally, this one that was silent turned and rebuked the other thief in the air of the murderer and said, we're dying justly. We deserve to be crucified. But not this man in the middle. He's a good man. He's the son of God. Then he turned to him and asked him what seemed to be an improbable, an impossible question. He said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Will you remember me, Lord? And then Jesus gave one of the most astounding answers in the history of the world. The angels in heaven must have been shaken and startled and amazed when they heard what Jesus answered. Jesus said, Today, today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Think of it. Here was a thief, a murderer, a man that had committed every crime in the book dying, turns to Jesus in his dying moment and says, Lord, remember me. He didn't even say, forgive me. He didn't even say, Lord, take me to heaven with you. He didn't say, Lord, prefer me. He just said, Lord, remember me. And Jesus answered quick as a flash and said, today, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. And to all of you people that think you can't be converted in a moment and that you cannot be saved at this hour and at this moment in this rain in Baton Rouge and have your whole life transformed, you read the stories of the New Testament and the encounters that people had with Jesus. There are many of you that came here tonight in this rain that never dreamed that you were going to meet Jesus. You came out of curiosity or you came because your bus was already on the way or you had already promised some friends to come or you're a student here at the university and you came out of curiosity. Many of the people of the New Testament that came to Jesus never planned it. 
They never thought that they would have their lives changed. This thief on the cross that had been in prison knew that he was going to die on a cross. He knew he deserved it. He never dreamed that before the night came, that day, he would be in heaven. He deserved judgment. He deserved hell. I'm going to see that man in heaven someday by the grace of God. He wasn't saved by his good work. He didn't even have time to be baptized. He didn't have time for anything. But he's in heaven. That's the grace and the mercy of God. And I want to tell you that the greatest word in all the language of men is forgiveness. That day, Jesus forgave him of every sin he had ever committed, wiped the slate clean, and he was in heaven. There are three things about this passage. The whole gospel is in it. There's repentance. It's the only deathbed repentance in the whole Bible. I don't know what led this fellow to ask that question or to make that statement. It might have been the prayer that Jesus had just prayed, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. It might have been what Jesus had said to John concerning his mother. I don't know what it is or what it was, but the Holy Spirit used it. The Holy Spirit used it to convict him and to convince him that he needed Jesus and he repented of his sins at that moment and he was saved. I can imagine the other thief saying, why, what have you done? Have you turned preacher or something? You remember we strangled that old merchant for his gold? Remember you kidnapped that little child? Remember that girl you raped? Remember that person you slew? You think God's going to forgive you? Are you turned a preacher? He can't forgive you. I don't care what your sin is. I don't care how deep in sin you've gone. I don't care what you've done. God can forgive you. God can cleanse you. God can make you a new person tonight if you put your faith and your trust in him. Yes, he repented. And the second thing he did was to believe. The Bible says if we believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. The scripture says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Just repent and believe, and then you'll be saved. He said, when thou comest into thy kingdom, as though he were thinking of some far off kingdom age somewhere. And Jesus answered and said, today, right now, you'll be saved. Right now you can have eternal life. You can put your trust and your confidence in Christ now. And he did. And that day, he went to paradise. Now, it's the word remember that I want you to think about a moment. He said, Lord, remember me. Did you know that God forgets? Did you know that there's a scripture in Jeremiah 31, 34 that says, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more? God can forget. God can forget your sins. What does God forget? God never forgets the universe. He sends the rain. Yes, sir, God sends the rain. But the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The sun comes upon the just and the unjust. God blesses all of us with all of his blessings. He never forgets. Suppose he forgot the sun rain. Suppose the sun ceased to shine. The earth would turn into a glacier. Suppose God would forget because the scripture says that God holds the whole universe together. And if God ever took his hand off, it would blow to pieces. And then the scripture says that God remembers you. Tonight, I had in my little office here where I see people, a lady and her children and a mother and their son and their husband is a prisoner in North Vietnam. 
I don't think any of us will ever know what these families have suffered. I don't think any of us will ever know what those boys out there have probably gone through psychologically and physically, never knowing. And then we had another one come and see us tonight, and her husband, she's just found out, is, a, is alive and a prisoner, but for a long time she didn't know. He was only missing an action. But let me tell you this, God remembers them. And when we bowed our heads in the little office and prayed that God would remember them and that his grace and his love would reach out to North Vietnam to the prison camp and touch them, God remembers them. And God answers prayer. How many times has God been with you? You don't even know. Because you see, you almost had a wreck the other day. But you were saved from it. Why? When you get to heaven, you may find out why. It might have been divine intervention. And that happens to all of us. God remembers you. And then God never forgets our sins either. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. The Bible says, God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The Bible says, for God shall bring every work into judgment. God is going to judge every sin that's ever been committed. What is your sin that so easily besets you? It's going to be brought to light, all the secret things. God is going to judge it. God never forgets sin. No sin has ever been forgotten by God. God has recorded everything you've ever done and all the things you've ever thought from the time you were born till the time you died. It's all there. It's all in the record book, and God will never forget. Nothing is going to be forgotten. How do you stand before God? But there's one thing God can forget. He can forget sin because of Christ. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He hath made him to be sin for us. It says in Isaiah 53, The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. It says in 1 Peter 2, 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. The scripture teaches that God can forget our sins because of Christ. The sin that would damn us, the sin that would send us to judgment, the sin that would send us to hell, God can forget. In Hebrews 1, 3, it says your sins are purged. In Isaiah 43, it says your sins are blotted out. In Psalm 103, it says your sins are put away. Isaiah 38 says your sins are put behind his back. And in Hebrews, it says God can remember your sin no more. Ladies and gentlemen, because Christ died, because he rose again, because of what he did, God cannot remember my sins. I've committed plenty of sins in my life. And even if I'd only committed one sin in my whole life, it's enough to cause me to go to the judgment and be lost because I could keep the whole law and yet offend in one point and I'd be guilty of all. But God has forgotten my sin. He forgot every sin that I have ever committed. Everyone he has forgotten. He's the only person in the whole universe that can forget. He has the ability to forget. Has he forgotten your sin? Have you brought your sin and laid it at the feet of Jesus? What a night to give your life to Christ. You may never have another moment like this. The Bible says, he that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. You've sat here for over two hours in the rain. Many of you are soaked all the way through. And you've done it because you want your sins forgiven, many of you, and others of you have sat here because you're praying for somebody that needs Christ. And this is your hour and your moment, and it may never come again like this. I'm going to ask you to do something that I saw people in London do. I saw people in San Diego do. I saw people in Pittsburgh do. 
I'm going to ask scores of you to get up out of your seat right now and come across this field in the rain and stand here and by coming say, I want Christ in my life. I want my sins forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to know that I will not be at the judgment in that final day. I want my life transformed by the power of Christ. I'm going to ask you to come right now, men, women, young people, God has spoken to you. You need Christ. And in a moment like this, you'll never forget it. I met a missionary out in the Far East a few months ago. Said, I received Christ one of those nights at Wembley Stadium in the pouring rain in England and stood ankle deep in mud to find Christ. And said, I thank God because if it hadn't been for the rain, I don't know whether I would have come that night or not. But he said there was something about the challenge of coming forward in the rain that challenged me, and it changed my life. Yes, it's not easy to come, but Christ went to the cross for you. And many people are on the way now. You get up and come and make your commitment to Christ. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. to all of you that have come. You've come tonight to make your commitment to Christ because you want your sins forgiven. You want to know you're going to heaven. You want a new direction in your life. And you've come to make a commitment to Christ because you want him to forget your sins and save your soul. Well, I want to tell you, he remembers you and he loves you and he wants to forgive you. He loves you. Keep that in mind now that God loves you and is willing to forgive and forget all the past. And from tonight on, there are four things that are very important. First, read your Bible every day. We're going to give you a Gospel of John. We want you to read it several times before you read any other part of the Bible. We're going to give you a Bible study. We're going to give you some verses of Scripture to learn, memorize. This helps you to grow. Desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, the scripture says. You cannot grow in the Christian life without reading and studying the scriptures every day. Secondly, pray. God will hear and answer your prayer. You're his child now. He loves you. Take every detail to God in prayer. He will answer your prayer. Don't let a day go by but what you spend a few minutes every morning, every evening, and all during the day in prayer and pray about everything whatever the details are nothing is too small to bring to god's attention and then thirdly witness for christ how do you witness you witness by the smile on your face you witness by the new attitude you have in the dormitory the new attitude you have toward work the new attitude you have in the home and then you witness by going to somebody of another race and going out of your way to be kind and courteous and gracious. And people will soon say, well, what's happened to you, Mary? And you can say, well, I've found Christ. He's changed my life. That's witnessing. And then fourthly, get into a church where Christ is preached and get to work for Christ. Get into the church and work in the church. You say, but I don't like to go to church. Jesus went to the churches of his day and they weren't all they were supposed to be. But he did it to set us an example that we should go to church. Four things, read the Bible, pray, witness, and go to church. Now I'm going to ask that we bow our heads and I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. Oh God, I am a sinner. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm willing to turn from my sin. I receive Christ as Savior. I confess him as Lord. 
from this moment on, I want to follow him and serve him in the fellowship of his church. In Christ's name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. It's Anne. She's in trouble. And if you don't take it to the edge every chance you get, you're dead already, baby. I was in trouble, and I didn't know what to do. Where are the juice? I knew that I could take on the world. It's like you're in a dream, but not really a dream. This is a reality. I don't really believe in all this, but I know something crazy is happening right now. Tonight! I'm glad to tell you as we close that the Lord Jesus Christ can be received. Your sins forgiven. The Billy Graham Library is a place for all walks of life. To recharge. Reflect. Renew your faith. And return again and again. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the 11th verse of Jude. Jude is a little book tucked away in the back of the Bible. And there are just a few verses, and this is just a phrase from one verse. And here's what it says. Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain. Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain. Now that's a strange expression, the way of Cain. And yet when I pick up the Bible, I find an interesting thing, that there are only two ways of life in the whole Bible. One is the way of Cain, and the other is the way of his brother Abel. Abel was accepted by God and Cain was rejected by God. So there's the way of Abel and there's the way of Cain. And tonight I want to talk about these two brothers because they were the first children in the history of the human race. God had created Adam and Eve. And they had two children, their first two children. Cain and Abel. And we find brothers all the way through the Bible like Jacob and Esau and Moses and Aaron and Absalom and Amnon, James and John, Peter and Andrew, Joseph and his brethren. And in the first or the fourth chapter of Genesis, you'll find the story, the fascinating, challenging, thrilling, tragic story of Cain and Abel. You see, they were the first children born they were the first farmers. They performed the first religious ceremony. And they had the first quarrel and the first act of violence that was ever done on this planet was done by Cain against his brother when he killed his brother in a fit of anger because of jealousy and envy. But Adam and Eve must have been excited when these boys came along because Eve said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. You see, Adam and Eve had just come through a terrible experience. 
they had rebelled against God in the Garden of Eden. Now, in the Garden of Eden, where they lived, there had never been a war. There were no armies. There were no police. They didn't need them. There were no jails. There was no poverty. There was no suffering. It was a marvelous world to live in. And they rebelled against God. And God drove them out of paradise, drove them out of the Garden of Eden. And it says a very interesting thing at the end of the third chapter of Genesis, so they wouldn't touch the tree of life. Why? If man had eaten of the tree of life, he would have lived forever in his sins. In that sense, death is a blessing to the human race. Suppose Hitler lived forever. Suppose people like Stalin and Eichmann lived forever and plagued the human race. But one generation passes and another comes. It's constantly changing and shifting. God drove them out so they wouldn't eat of that tree of life and live forever in their sins. But God also promised, before he drove them out, God promised that someday he would send a redeemer. And he illustrated it by going out and slaying some animals and shedding blood and clothing Adam and Eve in skins. And God was teaching that the only way ever to approach him in the future, forever, forever, was by the way of blood. And that is why you pick up the Bible and you'll find so much blood. Someone has said that Christianity is a bloody religion, and it is. The blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And every time you go and take communion in your church, and you pick up the cup of the juice or the wine, it's symbolic of the blood that was shed on that cross for you. And without the shedding of that blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Now, Cain was born with sinful instincts because, you see, we inherit the instinct to sin from our parents. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We read in our paper last week how they are now painting garbage cans and garbage sacks with psychedelic colors. And they do look pretty. I saw some of them. But inside, it's still garbage. Now, you're all dressed up tonight. Most people, when they come to a religious meeting, a church put on their best. You may come from a poverty-stricken area. You may not get but about $10,000 a year. You may be in dire poverty. <laughs> and you may be suffering in this beautiful bluegrass part of Kentucky. But on the inside, jealousy, pride, lust, idolatry, all the sin that mankind is guilty of is lurking inside of your own heart. You know, Jesus said to the Pharisees of his day that they were whited sepulchers, but inside they were rotting bones of death. No wonder the Pharisees didn't like him. He called them all kinds of names. You read the 23rd chapter of Matthew. He said on the outside, you look beautiful, you look fine, you're religious. You look like you're going to heaven. But I can see inside your heart, I see your pride, I see your lust, I see your hypocrisy. And God knows all the secret things and God looks down inside of you and he says to you, Mr. Baptist and Mr. Methodist and Mr. Assembly of God or whoever you may be, I see you and what I see indicates that your heart is full of rebellion. You need forgiveness. You need to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Now, when Cain was born, Eve, I think, thought 
that the birth of Cain was somehow a gift from God that would cancel out her sins. She thought that maybe Cain was going to be the Messiah that had already been promised. She said, my child is from God. You know, there's evidence everywhere that all of us would like to cancel out our past and our sins. We would like to get in touch somehow with God. But if we reject God's way and go the way of Cain as Cain rejected God, what do we turn to? We turn to the star. We turn to anything that will get rid of this guilt and give us some purpose and meaning in our lives as to why we exist. And Cain thought, or Eve thought, that maybe Cain was going to help her, her young son. But Cain, you know, was born into a world with tremendous advantages. There'd never been a war. There was no hate and no jealousy, no poverty. He had everything that a person could want. No one was ever killed. Nobody was ever murdered. Nobody ever stole anything. It was a marvelous world. And Cain also was religious. He and his brother both were religious. But that didn't satisfy them somehow. Cain decided to reject God's way. Cain decided to go his own way. And there are only two ways of life, the way of Cain and the way of Abel. They were both religious, and they came to worship God. But they came differently. God said, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. So Abel brought a sacrifice of blood. It was ugly. It was dirty. Why did God choose blood? You ever thought about that? Many of us are repulsed at the sight of blood. We hate to see it. Our sins are ugly. Our sins are dirty. And every time we see blood, it reminds us of our sins, which are ugly before God and will cause judgment. But Cain did not bring blood. He said, it's too dirty, it's too ugly. I'm going to bring the best fruits that I have. I'm going to bring the finest vegetables I have as an offering to God. But the Bible says it's better to obey than to sacrifice. The Bible says only by blood. We say we can get there some other way. We've got our own way figured out. And you know, a lot of people believe in Jesus today. They're accepting Jesus as a revolutionary hero. A lot of people are singing about Jesus, writing about Jesus. All that's fine. I hope it keeps up. But you be sure who Jesus is. He's more than just the superstar. Jesus is the son of the living God. And when he died on the cross, he didn't stay there. He rose from the dead. He's alive. And when he shed his blood, that blood meant something. It meant that God was now able to forgive all your sins. It meant that God was now able to transform you and write your name in the book of heaven because Jesus Christ died on that cross. God can now remain just and be the justifier of the sinner. You see, if I may say so reverently, God faced a dilemma. God said, the wages of sin is death. You have to die. You're under the sentence of death. How can God come along and just forgive it and wipe it out? The jury says that a man like Charles Manson is guilty. But suppose the judge would say, oh, we'll let Charlie go on back. He's got all those girlfriends and all those responsibilities and things. We'll just forget all that. That wouldn't be justice. Suppose God would say that to you. You're guilty. I'm guilty. We've broken God's laws, all of us. God cannot come along and say, let's forget it. Unless somebody pays the death penalty. We're under the sentence of death. Well, somebody did pay the death penalty for me and for you. 
Jesus Christ on the cross paid the death penalty, shed his blood, and now God can say, I forgive you, the debt is paid. That's how much God loves us. That's what the gospel is. The word gospel means good news. And the good news to the whole human race, black, white, yellow, red, whoever you are, whatever your social standing or your educational status, God is saying, I love you, I forgive you. That's the gospel. And I don't care what your sins are. I don't care how bad they are, how black they are, how dirty they are. God says, I forgive you. I love you. And I proved it by giving my son on the cross. That's the way of Abel. Now, the way of Cain is to say to God, no, I want to go to heaven. I want to be saved, but I'm going to go my own way. I'm not going to come your way, God. I don't like the way of blood. I don't like to go by the way of the cross. I don't want to die to self. I don't want to give everything up that I love, all these things desires and passions of mine they may be wrong but lord i want to hold on to them i'm going to go my own way and somehow i'll get that no you won't there's only one way to heaven one door it's the way of the cross and without the cross there is no salvation according to the bible so they brought their sacrifices to God. And you know, we're doing the same thing. We go to church. We try to live a good moral life. We pay our bills. We do the best we can. And we think that's going to be good enough. No, there has to come a time when you must be born again. There has to come a time when you are converted. And notice the scripture says in Hebrews 11:4 that Abel made his decision for God by faith. Abel didn't understand it. You don't have to be a theologian to come to Jesus Christ. You don't have to understand much about the gospel or the Bible when you come to Christ. Come with what little knowledge you have. You know you're a sinner. Your conscience tells you that. You know Christ is the Savior. That's all you have to know. Just come and receive it by faith. It says by faith, Abel made his sacrifice unto God. You see, Cain didn't come by faith. He came by his own works and his own goodness and his own ideas, chose his own path, and God said, no, Cain, you're rejected. But he accepted Abel, and Abel for certainty is in heaven, and we'll see him someday. Now, what happened? Cain became jealous. He became angry. And one day when they were out in the field, he picked up a rock and hit his brother over the head and killed him. Murder. The first violence. The first murder. The first war in the history of the human race. And it's been going on ever since. And it'll always go on till Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom. Because you see, war comes from the human heart. The Bible says, from whence come wars among you? Don't they come from your own lust? That war in your own beings? The world wars that we fought in this century are only extensions of the wars in our own hearts. There are many wars going on around the world right now, in addition to Vietnam. Man is a warring animal. He'll continue to fight and kill. There are wars going on in the cities of this country right now and in the rural areas. People being murdered by the hundreds every month. People being killed on the highways by drunken drivers and drivers under the influence of drugs. Fights and quarrels in homes between husbands and wives and children and parents. War, war, war. We're a warring people. And the first act of violence was committed by Cain because of jealousy. You see, it started in his heart. He probably thought about it a long time. 
He was jealous of his brother. And this jealousy gave vent until finally it ended in murder. And God came along one day and warned Cain, said, Cain, you know, sin crouches at the door. Even before he had ever committed that murder, God saw his heart and God saw what he was thinking and God said, Cain, watch out. Sin is in your heart. It crouches like a tiger. It crouches like a lion, ready to spring. I've heard people stand up and say, well, if I were in a certain place, I wouldn't do a thing like that. You don't know what you would do. You give all the circumstances surrounding that certain event, you might do it. We all have the tendency to lust and to hate and to have jealousy and pride in our hearts. We don't know what we would do. We're all rebellious against God. And under given circumstances with the right type of temptation, we might do anything. Or the right type of pressure, we might do anything. And Cain was warned by God, and God warned you in the Bible that you're capable of any sin. And every person in this audience tonight has broken the Ten Commandments, and the Bible says, if you've broken one, you're guilty of all. And after the death of Abel and after the murder had taken place and Cain had probably buried him to try to hide the evidence, God said, Cain, where's your brother Abel? And Cain said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And then God said this interesting thing. He said, the voice of thy brother's blood cries up from the earth. The Bible says your sins are written down. God said, Cain, you've sinned. I have to judge you. And God did judge him. God said, a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said, my punishment is greater than I can bear. And for the rest of his days, Cain bore that punishment for that one violent act in which he killed his brother. Jealous of him, hated him, then killed him. Give your life to Christ and you can face reality. You don't have to have a drug or a pill or a glass to face the reality of life or the circumstances or the troubles or the trials you're going through. Let Christ come in and take over your life and cast all your burdens on him for he careth for you. The Bible says that the Lord set a mark on Cain and Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Notice, he was close to paradise, yet a million miles from it. Billy Sunday once said, I'd sooner be a foot out of hell and headed away than to be a million miles out of hell and headed toward it. Some of you are close to the kingdom of God, but you might as well be a million miles away because you're headed in the wrong direction. You're headed in the direction of Cain. Religious, but you haven't yet experienced Christ for yourself. Others of you are headed toward heaven and the kingdom of God, stumbling, faltering, failing maybe. But yours is the way of Abel. You've come by the way of the cross. And you're saying, Lord Jesus, be my Lord and be my Savior and be my Christ. These two young men, Cain and Abel, typify all the young people that are in the world today. What about you? Have you made your commitment and your decision to Jesus Christ? Have you trusted him? You say, well, Billy, what do I have to do? You have to repent of your sins, and that means you have to be willing to give up your sins and change your way of living. Secondly, you have to come by simple childlike faith. Notice I said childlike. Jesus said you have to become as a little child. Now, there are many professors here tonight. You might be a PhD in science or philosophy or psychology or some other discipline, but you have to become as a little child intellectually and spiritually. And you have to say, Lord, I don't understand this. This is a realm that I don't understand, but I come by faith. It has to be a child's faith, like the faith of a child in its father or mother. And then you have to say, I'm willing to follow you and serve you no matter what the cost. 
Young man, young woman, father, mother, whoever you are here tonight, I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat, hundreds of you, as hundreds have come at every service, and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I do receive Christ. I want to go the way of Abel. I want my past forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I'm going to ask you to get up and come right now. And after you've come, I'm going to say a word to you, have a word of prayer, give you some literature, and you can go back and join your friends. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. If you've come in a bus, they'll wait. Those of you up in the gallery, it'll take a minute or two for you to come, but you get up and come right now, quickly, hundreds of you. Just get up from everywhere and come and stand here quietly. And the choir is going to sing, Just As I Am. You may be in the choir, and God has spoken to you tonight. There's a little voice that says you ought to come, the voice of the Spirit of God. And you may never have another moment quite like this. You get up and come. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll-free at 1-877-772-4559. That's that are watching by television from a bar or from your home or from a hotel lobby, you can see that hundreds of people are coming here on the campus of the University of Kentucky to make their commitment to Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. They want to go the way of Abel. I'm going to ask you to make that same commitment where you are. You can do it right now in the quietness of the place that you are. You can say yes to Jesus Christ. He will come into your heart. May God help you to make that decision and that commitment. God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll-free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. You're invited on a journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library. Retrace Billy Graham's path from humble farm boy to international ambassador of God's love through multimedia, photos, and memorabilia. But the fruit of the Spirit is love! That is a supernatural... Tour the restored Graham family home place, browse Ruth's attic bookstore, and have a meal at the Graham Brothers Dairy Bar. Enjoy special exhibits, events, and seasonal activities for the whole family. Admission is free. So come walk this journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library. It's Anne. She's in trouble. And if you don't take it to the edge every chance you get, you're dead already, baby. I was in trouble, and I didn't know what to do. Where are the juice? I knew that I could take on the world. It's like you're in a dream, but not really a dream, this is a reality. I don't really believe in all this, but I know something crazy is happening right now.